This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, and welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'i. Every once in a while, I'd like to take a pause and uh, discuss with my colleague, Jay Fidel here, who is uh, a regular also on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. And we get, a, we get a chance to sort of, you know, go off and, and talk about politics in Hawaii and the world and the like. And the recent visit by our famous president. 45. Uh, oh, the 45th president. They call him 45. Is that what they do? <laughs> okay. Well, in a recent visit by 45 to Hawaii allows us to take advantage of the usual programming and get in here and just talk about uh, whatever pops up about politics, politicians, and Trump, I guess. Uh, you know. So anyway, I'll uh, the 45th president visited the United States, and uh, it was so interesting because one of the security guards downstairs thought that was the greatest thing since uh, Kennedy. And but most people in my neighborhood were commenting about, "Oh man, that was wasn't it terrific that all these protesters were out." So I, I you know, there's obviously he's a very polarizing figure. What, 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 what are your feelings? About well, I mean, lots of feelings. I didn't, I didn't want him here. I don't need him here. I don't think any of us needed him here. He's not, he's not going to do anything for us or the country. But I remembered back in 19, oh, early 70s, I guess, late 60s, late 60s. My wife and I lived on Governor's Island in, in, in um, New York uh, Harbor. Oh, and it was uh, you had to get there with a little ferry, five minutes. Right, ferry right. Ride, I'm yeah. very familiar with the place. Yeah, and and uh, it, it was accessible from the East Side Drive, FDR, I think they called it, and the West Side Drive, all coming together at the right. Battery of Manhattan. You know? Right. And uh, near near the Battery, uh, just a, really a hundred yards away, was the Heliport. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, right. Right on Wall Street there. And um, Nixon, uh, Republican also, <laughs> he, he loved to come in on that heliport and fly in. And when he did, you know, they did the security oh, number, right? Yeah, right. They stopped the traffic for miles around. And the whole lower Manhattan was jammed up every single time. We couldn't get back to Governor's Island. The ferry wasn't working because security, security. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, gee, this is basically inconsiderate. Nobody liked Nixon. I mean, really, he was, he was in my world. Nobody liked him, and um, and I, I thought of that. I thought of that when Trump decided that he was going to stay uh, in, in Waikiki. Waikiki. No, I mean, by the way, where did he stay when he went down to? He Waikiki? did not stay at the Trump Tower. They okay, ate there. I, they ate there. They ate at their they, Trump they, Tower. They, yeah, uh, but they stayed because at, he seems to have a way of always promoting his brand. No matter where in the world I think he, he was, goes. he was going to be subject to criticism if he did that, so he didn't do it. Yeah. He stayed at, a, I forget the name, of a very fancy hotel down there. I mean, there. like the Holly Kulani or something? No, it wasn't the Holly Kulani. It was a national chain, but uh, I forget what. Oh, okay. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I'm sure he had a... Well, we would, we would mention the name if you would make a contribution to Tink Tech Hawaii. <laughs> tick Tank, Tick Tink Tech Hawaii. <laughs> Um, we would, we would. <laughs> I will find out. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Go Call ahead. anytime. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, the number 808-374-2014. Make a contribution, and I promise you, it'll be on the air. And we're having a fun drive right now. You know? <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> Thanks for Think Tech. Anyway, uh, so uh, name will come to me, but he, he stayed there instead, and I'm sure he had a you know huge luxury and everything, and family. He probably loved it, and, and well, my uh, wife was commenting because she was watching see, and when he when he landed in Japan. One of the first things he did was he talked to every serviceman that they could bring into the audience, you know. And he, she said to me, she said his people have a way of generating these huge events, or at least looking like these huge events. And uh, and I thought that that's true. I mean, Trump loves this. He gets rejuvenated by, 
it's almost like Benito Mussolini, you know? I mean, these kind of characters, uh, in my mind... Well, they give him unconditional love. Yeah, it, it, he, they like to stand in front of thousands of people. The, the, uh, the, the uh, dictator of uh, North Korea. This, Kim Jong-un, yeah. Jin Jong, yeah, Kim Jong-un. He just, you know, he brings out all his military... And I say, well, is this an image that you, you know? Well, I worry about his relationship with the military. He wants to spend trillions, many trillions, doing more nuclear weapons, a weapons stockpile. And, you know, John, my own impression is one of his big agenda points in going to Asia is to encourage them to arm up against North oh, Korea. Well, and and that's, that's his alliance with, with Abe. Abe has been spending, you know, the last, what, five years or so trying to amend the Japanese Constitution yeah. to allow that to happen. Yeah. And actually, Abe is not the first to suggest that, nor is Trump the first United States president to suggest that the Japanese need to pick up more of the uh, military burden for the defense of Asia. But the way he does it, it almost resembles... Uh, as I said, some of these, you know, little dictators. Dictators. That's what it sounds like, really. He'd like every all. He'd be surrounded with uniforms and spend a lot of money. I mean, and the amount of money he's spending on military now is more than it was before. And what he's doing, which we don't hear all about, um, is, is a lot. It's more than Obama was doing. Well, well, some of the things that that you need to that we have to be concerned about is first of all. As you expand the military, who gets the military contracts? Who, big business. Big business. But big business who may be connected, number one, because the, the Trumps have a way of <laughs> being connected to, to all of this. And the second thing is the cost of that buildup is probably, as he stands in front of the soldier and says, I'm going to bring you new equipment and all of this, the cost of that, of whatever he's promising, is probably something that affects the, the uh, uh, that's being taken away, like health care, from the mil, uh, the mil, the serviceman's they don't, families. They don't see that though. They don't get. There that, is that they, connection. Yeah, though, sure. You know. Well, I mean, it's, and it's, this it's whole a, idea of holding uh, the entire health care system, holding it ransom, is uh, you know, um, I think, just. Uh, it's sinful, and 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 nobody. Uh, seem, we seem to have forgotten about it because he's led us down about fifteen rabbit holes since he announced that he was going to withhold uh, Medicare payments. Yeah, you know, it, it strikes me that this this um, it's an implicit expectation. We expect the president to abide by and execute the laws. He's the executive. Um, but there are a lot of laws that he is not only ignoring, he's pulling the wings out of existing statutes. Exactly. He's not, he's not honoring, he's not, he's not abiding by the laws of this country. Uh, how can you knock, how you knock down Obamacare by pulling the wings out of it when it is the law? He has been unable to change it, but he's just it, doing it. It is the law, and, it, it, and, and it's, uh, it's also the only thing out there that are keeping many people alive. And yet, we're going to play poker with it. We're going to treat it like this is some real estate negotiation, oh. and I'm going to leverage you with whatever I by holding off funds or, or, or these kinds of things. Yeah. But unlike that situation, we got millions of people whose lives are, are on the line, you know? And he's setting it up so it's going to get worse. I mean, this tax cut is going to result in less collections for the federal government. They won't have as much money. So what, what, what is he going to do? He's not going to have the money t to do health care. And well, his he's philosophy... going to be like, uh, like Lyndon Johnson found, found out. You can't have guns and butter at the same yeah, time. You know? True. And so we're either going to build a great society or we're going to build uh, an army like uh, the North Koreans have done. He's dismantling our society, John. It's, it's, it's really quite sad. Now, uh, <clears throat> what's interesting, though, as we were talking about earlier is that he did reach out to the Democrats in Hawaii. I mean, he had a conversation with the mayor and with the governor, 
who obviously talked about the mass transit system, <laughs> which is something that I, I, I don't, you know, so he, he does these things, which uh, other politicians, you know, it's, it seems like everything focuses around him. In fact, they were asked, they were, uh, reporters asked him on his, because of his trip, trip to Asia right now, you know, you've got all kinds of unfilled positions in your administration, particularly the State Department, uh, and yet you're taking this trip without any support, without any, and he, and he um, basically, what he said was something along the lines like, well, I'm the only one that counts. None of those positions mean anything. I'm the one that counts. So what I say is foreign policy. <laughs> I, and, and in a way, he's absolutely you know, correct. He's dismantling the State Department. I wonder why Rex Tillerson stays around. He's, he's you know, he's losing his, his edge, his authority, his options all the time. He's having the rug pulled out from under him on a regular basis. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how the one thing to his credit is that Trump has uh, appointed some people who are, you know, knowledgeable. Uh, and uh, really, in a way, and, and committed to this country, but the way he, <laughs> the way he treats them, is uh, it's amazing. I I couldn't work with somebody like that. Yeah. I just. Well, anyway, he came to Hawaii. He met with our politicians. He sn snarled the traffic for a couple of days. <laughs> I, was I, stayed, I, stayed in, I stayed in my house. A lot of I, people, they closed the schools. A, a lot of businesses and government offices <laughs> were closed because of this. And I say, you see, it's the height of, of inconsideration. You see, Did you, uh, there were comments. People have been commenting about the number of people who were out protesting the visit. Uh, were you aware of any of that? I know there was a protest at the Capitol. And yeah, the probably, it was in the had. hundreds, maybe. It wasn't. What major. about the one on uh, on the street the next day? Was it I, anything? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, it's these protests. Uh, you, you want them in a way. You want them to be more, but they're not that great. It's not. You get tired. People get tired of protesting. Remember what happened right after he was. He was uh, inaugurated, you know, not my president, and thousands of people went to well, Washington. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you can't do that all the time. You know, it's, it, well, it you can't old. do that for four years, you know, so you yeah. better get... But what's, you know, and, and the, the, the left or the progressives in our society, in a way, have been very successful with direct action. I mean, whether you go back to the, uh, the labor movement or the suffrage, Suffrage uh, for women's uh, right to vote, and then the labor movement, the the, uh, the all-time civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and yet um, when I when I saw these uh, protests, it seemed to me like in a way they they were so 20th century. <laughs> you know what was interesting to me after uh, with regard to Trump, which I which I thought was. He, he goes to uh, Europe and he pulls us out of the Paris Agreement, right? And California says, not for me, I'm in it. And Arizona says the same thing, you know, or, or I don't know if Arizona, but who else? Uh, yeah. Others others as well, other cities. And I'm thinking, that is 21st century. If you're going to deal with Trump, then, uh, then we need to deal with him e effectively. Yeah, that's like Douglas Shin, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, exactly. what he's absolutely. doing is it, absolutely. You know, take, take state action. Take state action. Say, ah, no, not for me. Yeah. You know, start exercise. And and that leads us to local politics, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and that's where we <laughs> want to go because you know, after a certain <laughs> amount of time, Trump gets to be monotonous. Yes, he does. <laughs> not for you, know, you know, we've seen it. We've done it. Well, we'll be right back uh, with a discussion of what's happening in Hawaii, <laughs> politics-wise. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the Hispanic Hawaii host. Think Tech is important to me because it provides me the opportunity to express my freedom of speech 
and also empower me to exchange ideas and views within our community. For the first time, ThinkTech Hawaii is participating in online web-based fundraise campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to ThinkTech, we run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so that ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civil engagement through free programming like mine. I have already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktechcalsbox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, gracias for your generosity. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe. If you've got a question that you'd like to throw into the mix, call us at 808-374-2014. And my guest this afternoon, not really my guest, my co-host this afternoon <laughs> and political expert is Jay Fidel, <laughs> the president and founder of, uh, one of the founders at least, or maybe the founder of... Um, Think Tech Hawaii. There were originally four of us. There were? Yeah. Oh, well, someday we need to get into that. Story. Yeah, we, we should. Well, maybe we should real quickly. Tell me who else was. Oh, okay. We were, um, we, we, we formed the organization in the year 2000. Yeah. Um, there were four of us. It was Lori Akau, uh, a real estate person. Uh, there was Don Mangiarelli, a tech person. Uh, it was Gordon Bruce, who's still with us. You're right, right, show. right. And it was me. And we uh, ultimately found our way to HPR and had a radio show, show there until 2008. Well, I, I have a feeling that one of the reasons why you founded all of this was so that we can have the kind of conversations we have today. Exactly right. John. Which is to talk about current affairs exactly in right. Hawaii yeah. and the nation. So what's happening in Hawaii right now is that every politician that I know seems to want to run for another office. Yes, and I like to sort of just take a footnote on that. It, we're going to have, I don't want to say circus, but we're going to have a lot of people running for a lot of offices. It's going to be an active political year, guarantee. Is it a good thing? Well, it's a good thing for people like us, and it'll be a good thing for this <laughs> show, because obviously I intend to do as much as I can to have a bunch of them up here, yeah. uh, maybe together even, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and talking about uh, the issues yeah, that great. face our state. Yeah. I'm not so sure it's a good thing for the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. And the reason why I'm not so sure is that, unfortunately, when you have this kind of an exciting year, a lot of talent may get left uh, you know, on the outside. People who have to resign their offices to run for the other office. Or, or two good people running against each other. And one of them has to lose. Right. And, you know, and I've said this publicly, so I'll say it again. You know, um, uh, Congresswoman Hanabusa, for example, I, I think she's outstanding in Congress. And um, when she comes back, not only are we going to lose a good congresswoman, one way or the other, if she wins the governorship or if she doesn't, uh, you know, we, the, that spot is going to be filled by somebody new. Somebody who is, un, uh, you know, in a way, untested, yeah, doing... No seniority uh, at all. Right. Doing a very important time. Hopefully. No, we don't seem to be able to do it. And in some sense, it's very frustrating. But um, the Democrats don't seem to be able to win, even with Trump practically handing them. Elections. I don't understand that at all. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't either. And it's, um, it's frustrating. But if things go the way I'm sure God intends it to, <laughs> it, we, we, the Democrats, should win some, a few seats, maybe even create a majority. Yeah. And if that ever happened, we would want our best and senior people on the front line. Good lines, point. You know, in, uh, on the congressional delegation. Yeah. The other thing is, again, you know, heaven forbid 
But uh, Senator Hirono has her own uh, health problem. It was problem. in the paper this morning, yeah. You know, and uh, I love Maisie. I've known her for as long as she uh, she has been in politics, and I, w I, I will, you know, continue to support her. But if anything goes the way we hope it doesn't, that's another... Uh, another loss. Another loss. So you have all of these... People that are, you know, looking for, um, I guess, advancement, and, and you don't blame them. After all, this is our system. But uh, you know, it may be a fun year initially, but in the long run, I, I'm a little worried about what the consequences might. Be. Yeah, and I and I think in, in in our time of polarization and fragmentation, we we have the same malaise as the mainland does, maybe in lesser degree. We 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 can't reach conclusions. Well, I tell you we can't one get thing. Done. I think one thing, and I and I'm saying this in all due respect and kindness. Okay, I think our governments. No, when I say governments, I mean the county and the state governments here in the state, in Hawaii, are far too dominated by lawyers. <laughs> no, absolutely. John, you're a lawyer. Oh yeah, and that's the response every time I say that. But you're a lawyer, Jay. You're a lawyer. Oh, we're all lawyers. You know, the one thing that, as a lawyer, I know, is that the person making policy should not be wearing a lawyer's hat. He should be wearing a policy hat. Once that is done, then the lawyers come in. Because the lawyer's job is to assess risk. And say no. And say no. <laughs> which means that if you, if you which is why, by the way, when I, and I, and I, I had one of the best attorney generals in the state. And he knew, in, in the history of Hawaii, frankly, and he knew he knew, he understood what I just said. Who, who was that? This was uh, Warren Price. Ah, yes. Okay? So <clears throat> he understood that there was policy and there was the lawyer. There was the client and there was the lawyer. The trouble with government lawyers is they tend to think of themselves as judges. Okay? They think of themselves as judges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the attorney general, the court counsel, writes an opinion and believes that's the law. Yeah. And all it is is one side of the argument. Yeah. It doesn't really rise. So the, to the real law, yeah. issue whenever you get whenever you do anything is how do I serve the public best? And if the lawyer if you if you say there's this so all I want to know is not yes or no whether I can or cannot as a decision maker. I want to know quantum of risk involved. How likely it is for something to happen. Not that it can happen and you can get sued. Because every government lawyer will tell you immediately you're going to get sued. <laughs> Somebody will, if you, if you make a public park and you open it up and it has sidewalks, somebody is going to fall down and you're going to get sued. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't open the park. It's that kind of thinking that led to the closing of Kakaako. Ah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. You see, we didn't solve the real problem, no, which is what all. do you do with homeless people? Really? So now we, in, in, and so what at one point some lawyer, I, I'm willing to bet, I wasn't in the room, walks into the room and says, you know what, this is risky, you're going to get sued. So we closed down the whole park. And I, I just drove through there, and it's, you know, not only do you close down the park, but to show that you're being productive, what do you do? You take property all around the park, and you lease it out for cars to park. <laughs> so one of my favorite all-time projects, which was Kaka'ako Waterfront Park, sure. uh, you know, I, I can tell you where that all began. I'll tell you where it all began. Marilyn Barnhorse, who had just lost the, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, race for mayor against Frank Fossey, called me up when I was lieutenant governor and said, John, can I take you out for a picnic? And we went out and we sat in this garbage dump <laughs> in the front of Honolulu. <laughs> she was she trying said, to make a point. <laughs> she said, this could be a park. Uh, 
And I said, you know what, Marion, Marilyn, fantastic. And then I went back and I said, we're going to read the developed caca. And Senator Russell Blair said, that's got to be a park. And so we built the park. And now we have a children's museum in this park. We are beautiful. But because we didn't come up with a solution for one problem, we create a second problem. And that second problem we're creating right now is we're closing off the waterfront because of somebody's risk assessment uh, to people in Hawaii. So, I mean, you got me on my sandbox. It's I was okay. It's to, okay. Not to do it. But, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is that we are running out of public spaces. I'm into public spaces. Parks are so critical for our, our, our existence as a community and individually. We don't have enough parks. Everybody talks about the beauty of Hawaii, but it's not available to most people. It's too hard to get to. To our people. To our people. Yeah, it's available to tourists. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got some of the best. Go go to the Royal, I mean, the Sheridan Hotel. Yeah. You got to talk about being the beaches being available. It's right out front. Yeah. Yeah. But where, you know, where our people need to go or be is what's getting closed off. Yeah. It's like... You know, it was like the other day, and again, and this is, is I'm being critical, but I'm, I'm, I'm also doing this with a great deal of respect. But it's like saying in the Hawaiian Homes hearing that my job is to build homes so I can spend $33 million to build rentals. You know, <laughs> and, and I, which is, there's a whole backstory to this, and we just ran out of, almost running out of time. But it, it was amazing to me that money would be sitting around when there are so native, so many Native Hawaiians who so are never homeless got in their own land. Yes, you can't. You Huge can't percentage have that. of the homeless Native Hawaiians. Yeah, you can't. That wasn't existing in the past. Yeah. In the past, somehow they were absorbed into our communities. No, what? And uh, and so this is, uh, I you know, I think instead of trying to get promoted. More people need to concentrate on how we get make better what we know. Here. Right, and not worry about this kind of risk assessment thing. Yeah, well, that's the problem. That's why, so we start off, I close, you know, go back to the full circle. Got to stop letting lawyers decide what is public <laughs> policy. You need, and I don't mean that as an occupation. Some of the best lawyers, I, some of the best policy makers I know are lawyers. But they got to start thinking like a policymaker and not like pre a pretend judge. Right. And uh, for the benefit of the community, for the for greater the good. Gr and stick with it. Find well, that that's policy the reason why when I used to have to negotiate with some of the most radical groups in Hawaii, I, I always sent uh, Norma Wong because she, she had the one qualification <laughs> I wanted. She could find a solution or at least where we needed to go because she wasn't tangled up in some legal mumbo jumbo, <laughs> which should come second. I'm not saying you should ignore it now. Yeah, Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah, the yeah, law yeah. is the law. But the assessment needs to be done and the purpose up front, and then we, we'll do it. But anyway, that's some advice to some of my friends, Governor, if you're listening, Mayor, if you're listening. And all those people running for office. And all those people running for office. Don't let the lawyers decide what's good for us. You should do it. Yeah, and when you run for office and when you win, think of policy. Think of policy that policy. benefits us all and what stick with it. What benefits Hawaii. Yeah. And thank you for putting up with us. I know we are short of time, and I have enjoyed spending time with you, the Jay, as usual. It's been fun. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha, and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>